In Magic, the less a spell costs to cast, the better. Taking this to extreme, cards that cost zero instantly take a special place in the metagame. Wizards is, usually, careful to make the effects of zero mana spells weak to help balance them out. Even then, tons of cards at this mana cost still have seen competitive play. Today, we're going to go over the best cards that cost exactly zero mana. To be clear, this means the spell has the number zero printed as the mana cost, not a card that has some way for the mana to cost no mana. Starting us off at number 10, we have Everflowing Chalice. This is an artifact that costs zero mana, obviously. However, it does have multi-kicker too. This means that as an additional cost to cast the spell, you can pay two mana to kick it, and you can kick it any number of times. Chalice gets a counter for each time it's kicked, and you can tap it to add one colorless mana for each counter on Chalice. So if you pay two mana when you cast Chalice, it taps for one. Four mana taps it for two, six mana taps it for three, and so on and so on. Despite being so modular, Chalice is surprisingly on rate for a ramp spell. Two mana is the standard for a mana rock that adds one mana, though they usually make colored mana instead. Four mana rocks tap for two or three mana, and six mana rocks are usually just unplayable, but the ones that do exist make around three mana. Chalice was only slightly worse than the other ramp options available, and its modularity makes it able to fill any part of your curve. This made Chalice an attractive option for decks that wanted a lot of mana in standard. Chalice could let you get your Grave Titan or Warm Coil Engine a turn or two early, which was pretty game-winning thanks to how insane these cards were, especially all the way back then when Standard was a lot weaker. The card has also seen a surprising amount of play in non-rotating formats as well, specifically in the modern format. The card had a major resurgence in the format thanks to the printing of Urza Lord High Artificer. This is a powerful creature that, importantly, lets you tap any artifact you control to add one blue mana. Thanks to the card's mana value of 4, it could be a bit troublesome to actually get onto the field. Chalice would let you cast Urza a turn early, but importantly, once Urza was out, you could just cast it for 0 mana if you wanted. While it wouldn't have any counters, you could still tap it with Urza's ability for mana. Chalice was one of the many, many cheap artifacts the deck would play to enable their Urza, and Chalice had the extra upside of being a ramp spell in a pinch, as well as synergizing with cards like Emery, Lurker of the Lock, who made herself cheaper to cast while you had artifacts. While it did see play in these decks, Chalice was usually played at only one or two copies, as it wasn't a major piece of the deck. While less of a consideration, Chalice is also a very popular mana rock and commander, especially in decks with proliferate, which allowed you to cheat extra counters onto the Chalice. Ultimately, the card isn't all that impactful, but most zero mana spells aren't. It's the card's versatility that has let it find several homes over the years. And in number 9, we have Paradise Mantle. This is a zero mana artifact equipment. It has the ability where the equipped creature can be tapped at one mana of any color, and you can equip it for one mana. Essentially, this turns any creature into a Birds of Paradise, hence the name. Initially, you may think this card is a bit weak. After all, why would you bother casting Mantle, cast a creature, and then pay mana to attach the Mantle to try and ramp instead of just casting a Mana Dork, like Land of War Elves or Birds of Paradise, for the matter. Of course, not every deck will be in green and sometimes non-green decks just really want some mana dorks, and some of these decks really like having artifacts or equipments around. The main home Paradise Mantle has found is the good old Hammer Time. This is a combo deck built around getting around Colossus Hammer's massive equip cost by cheating it onto creatures. To do this, they use cards like Sigarda's Aid and Pure Steel Paladin, which can let you equip cards for free under the right circumstances. Not having to pay the one mana to equip Mantle can let it go from a mana neutral card the turn you play it to a mana positive one. Normally, you'd have to cast it, pay one to equip it to a non-summon set creature, then tap the creature for one. But if you skip having to pay one to equip, you can generate the mana without downside. It's especially powerful with Pure Steel Paladin, as Paladin draws you a card whenever you play an equipment. This means that Mantle can be mana positive and card neutral, something that can be said for very few cards, especially ones that cost no mana to start with. In fact, Mantle used to see play with Paladin as part of a much more inconsistent combo deck alongside much worse cards like Spider Silk Net. Unfortunately, Mantle is still very reliant on other cards to be any good, which has prevented it from seeing too much play and as a result, stopped it from getting any higher up on this list. And at number 8, we have Zuran Orb. This is an artifact that, once again, costs 0 mana. It is the ability where you can sacrifice a land to gain 2 life. Sacrificing lands is a pretty huge cost, as it permanently lowers your mana production. However, this card was actually extremely playable for years in Standard, 
and has found some homes in older formats as well. In standard, the card saw a ton of play, mostly in sideboards, without any real strings attached. If you were on a slower, more controlly deck, gaining a bit of life could give you the time you need to take over the game. Sure, sacrificing your lands was a huge cost, but if the difference between losing the game that turn or living, you'd sacrifice your lands. Orbs could also be used exactly as many times as you needed for any situation, while cards like Healing Salve, on top of not being particularly good, also only ever gained you 3 life, which isn't enough to keep you alive against a ton of aggro boards. Considering the relative lack of options for a lot of decks, Orb became an attractive option for a life gain spell. In older formats, Orb did just a bit more. The card saw playing Legacy for a lot longer than you might expect. Up until fairly recently, Straightforward Burn was still a viable deck in Legacy. While there were very powerful combo decks available, Burn and Combo lost to very different cards, so it held a place in the metagame for a very long time. Once again, Orb saw play in the format as a way to beat aggro, specifically Burn. This was particularly good in Legacy Lands, a deck that specialized in recycling their lands with life from the loam and replaying them quickly with exploration. Orb really shows off just how important efficiency is in a card. Despite having a huge downside and having a relatively weak effect, Orb costing no mana at all has meant it has still been the best card for the job on several occasions. And at number 7, we have Welding Jar. This is a free artifact with the ability where you can sacrifice it to regenerate target artifact. This means that the next time it would be destroyed this turn, you instead tap it, remove it from combat, and remove all damage from it, which is only really relevant if it's an artifact creature. Regeneration is a keyword that's been slightly less useful than it may seem, thanks in no small part to a ton of removal spells specifically preventing it from working. While this is a bit of an issue, it doesn't really matter for the applications of Welding Jar. Thanks to a few cards that synergize with artifacts, almost any zero mana artifact could see play as long as it has an even somewhat useful ability. The previously mentioned Urza Lord High Artificer obviously works extremely well with zero mana artifacts in general, and Welding Jar was one of the better artifacts to play for the deck. For zero mana, you get an artifact you can tap for mana that can also protect powerful cards like Mystic Forge and force your opponent to remove them twice. It's also very strong in hardened scales decks. This is a deck built around artifact synergies, particularly abilities like Modular and especially Arcbound Ravager, which work really well with hardened scales. Scales lets you put an extra plus one plus one counter in your creature whenever you would get one, and this deck specializes in putting tons of counters everywhere extremely quickly. Jar is a zero mana artifact you can sacrifice to your Ravager to try to push for lethal or to protect an important threat in a pinch, all for the low, low investment of nothing at all. Jar may not be the card that wins the game, but the extra protection consistency shouldn't be underestimated. And at number six, we have Ornithopter. This is a 0-2 artifact creature with flying that you can cast for no mana. On its own, the card does literally nothing. It can't deal damage, and while it can block, it's not a good blocker. It will usually just die in most combats to whatever it's blocking, making it far worse than walls that cost mana. The great thing about costing no mana to cast is that the card doesn't have to do all that much on your own as long as your deck has plenty of ways to take advantage of the card. Ornithopter, being an artifact, works with a ton of artifact-based decks. However, for the most part, it sees play in different broken artifact-based decks than the ones we've mentioned so far. It's most commonly used in straightforward affinity decks, the ones that actually use the affinity mechanic. This is an ability that makes your spells cost one less to cast for each artifact you control. Ornithopter not only gives you a free discount for your spells, it also is a great place to put your cranial plating, which gives a creature plus one plus zero for each artifact you control. This lets Ornithopter go from being a useless toy to something more like a war machine, taking out huge chunks of your life out of nowhere. On the topic of absurd equipment, it's also one of the more popular targets for Colossus Hammer in Hammer Time. It even lets you go for somewhat inconsistent but terrifying turn 2 kills in a deck with two copies of Hammer and see Guard as aid. While we're here, we should go ahead and give a quick shout out to basically every other zero mana creature. From Memnite to Shield Sphere to Phyrexian Walker, Decks have found ways to abuse basically every one of these cards at some point as part of a combo deck. Memnite and Ornithopter are the most popular thanks to having one power and flying respectively. But being a free creature has proven to be abusable no matter the stat line or abilities. And at number 5 we have Summoner's Pact. This is a green instant that's completely free and the effect research your library for a green creature card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle. Also, during your next upkeep, you lose the game unless you pay 2 and 2 green. Tutors are always good. 
and getting one for free is amazing. Of course, like most contracts, you do need to read the fine print. Paying 4 mana or losing the game on your following turn means that casting Pact on turn 1 is inadvisable. At first glance, this card may look worse than similar searchers like Eladrami's Call, especially with it being restricted to only one color of creature. This is true for the average deck, but some decks really, really need to be able to find a specific creature and want it without any sort of mana investment. The main deck that fits this bill are combo decks, most commonly Amulet Titan. This is a deck that tries to get Primeval Titan out as soon as possible and kill the opponent with a variety of powerful lands. Titan is incredibly important to the deck and Amulet Titan wants to win as fast as it can, so Summoner's Pact fits the bill perfectly. Prime Time itself is a particular note of the deck as it ramps two lands out of your deck when it enters a battlefield or attacks. Since the deck usually tries to swing with Primeval Titan the turn it plays it with the help of cards like Handware Battlements, Primeval Titan will completely pay you back for all the mana you spend on Pact next turn with the four lands it gets. This means that in this deck, Summoner's Pact is basically just four extra copies of one of your most important combo pieces. Amulet Titan is the card's main home, but it has seen play in other decks as well. Back when Neo Brand was a deck before Simeon Spirit Guide got banned, Pact was useful as a way to tutor for important cards. This deck would instantly win if the combo went off, so it didn't really matter that it could never pay for the Pact next turn. Summoner's Pact is pretty much the go-to card for busted green combo decks, and that's not going to change anytime soon. And at number 4, we have Tormod's Crypt. This is an artifact that's completely free that lets you tap and sacrifice it to exile target player's graveyard. Graveyard decks are very common in a variety of formats and most decks will be interested in cards to answer these strategies, at least in the sideboard. There are various factors that make different graveyard hate cards attractive for different decks, but costing no mana is hard to beat. Crypt completely exiling your opponent's graveyard is more than enough to completely shut off a big play from a graveyard deck. Living End and Reanimate can't bring back creatures that aren't there after all. This has led Crypt to being one of the most common sideboard cards in the game. While this is true, it does have stiff competition. Rest in Peace not only exiles the graveyard when it enters the field, it stops cards from ever going to the graveyard at all. This means that powerful death triggers won't even be able to trigger, let alone get brought back with another card. Leyline of the Void also stops cards from entering your opponent's graveyard and costs no mana to play if you have it in your opening hand. Of course, these cards also have their own downsides. Rest in Peace costs mana and is symmetrical, so it shuts off your own graveyard as well. Leyline of the Void is also pretty much awful if you don't open it thanks to costing 4 mana when not sheeted out. Crypt also has additional synergies in its favor, like being able to be grabbed off of cards like Karn the Great Creator. This leaves Crypt in a weird position as it's not exactly the best at what it does, but certainly isn't outclassed by any other cards either. And at number 3 we have Pact and Negation. This is a blue instant that's entirely free. It has the effect to counter target spell, but you have to pay 3 and 2 blue during your next upkeep or you lose the game. Similar to Summoner's Pact, this is a card that's free to cast, but has a huge tax on a later turn that you have to pay. Unlike Summoner's, there's not another card you'll be finding that will get around this major weakness like Primeval Titan did. While this may make it seem like Pack of Negation would have a harder time seeing play as a result, countering a spell is an effect that a lot of decks are interested in playing. Luckily for them, Pact of Negation is free forever if there isn't a next turn's upkeep to go to. As long as you're able to win the game on the turn that you use Pact of Negation, the card has basically no downside. As a result, combo decks have flocked to the card as a way to insulate their plays from their opponent's spells. Now, this may seem like a huge weakness, as if you use Pact of Negation and don't manage to win and you don't have the mana to pay for the Pact, then your opponent can simply pass turn and let you lose to your own card. This would theoretically come up a lot in formats like Modern and Legacy as well, as 5 mana is so much that the vast majority of decks won't be able to pay off the loan before even the slowest decks in the format have found lethal. However, combo decks in Magic are typically very all-in. You have to use so many resources on your combo that if it doesn't work, you'll be so far behind that you'll lose anyway. The number of games where you go for combo, it gets stopped, and then you still manage to claw your way back and win is very low. Overall, it's better to put everything into trying to win the game with your combo than it is to hedge your bets and try to make failing the combo less painful. Importantly, this means that Pact of Negation doesn't really need to be played in a blue deck, as you're never planning on paying for the Pact anyway. Combo decks of any color can use Pact, making it one of the few counterspell options for decks not in blue. 
Essentially, every combo deck has played Pact at some point, depending on the metagame. Stopping an opponent's force of will from hitting your most important spell is simply too valuable in these decks. And at number 2, we have Mishra's Bauble. This is another 0 mana artifact. It has the ability where you can tap and sacrifice to look at the top card of target player's library. You also draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. Bauble is yet another card that doesn't do a lot on its own, but can be used with other cards to great effect. There are a ton of ways that players have scrounged bits of extra value out of Bauble. The first partner Bauble found was an old classic, Tarmogoyf. This two mana creature gets bigger for each card in either graveyard with a unique type. It was a stellar threat for most of Magic's lifespan and Bobble allowed you to put a specific artifact into your graveyard for no mana and without losing a card permanently. This made Bobble a fine partner for the card. Fine being the operative word. For most of the cards relatively long time in the game, Bobble didn't see much fanfare. That all changed with Shadows over Innistrad, where they released the Delirium mechanic. This is a mechanic that gave you a bonus if you have four or more card types amongst the cards in your graveyard. This meant that Bobble putting an artifact into your graveyard went from being helpful to being a premium. Suddenly, Bobble was everywhere. It was the go-to artifact for any deck that wanted to turn on its Delirium cards. Even better for Bobble, Delirium has gotten more cards over time, if anything. The cards Unholy Heat and Dragon's Rage Channeler were printed in Modern Horizons 2 and were incredibly powerful. At this point, both cards are basically staples in red decks. This isn't even getting into when Loras of the Dream Den was legal for formats and how disgusting the card was with it. Mishra's Bobble is an incredibly powerful card but it can't really hold a candle to the number one card on this list. Hey you, are you tired of boring, predictable merch? Wouldn't you love it if you could have something more exciting? Something with a random chance to give you more than what you spent on it, but in a legally distinct way that's not gambling? Well, we have nothing like that for you, but we do have something pretty similar. Introducing the Duologs Duologs TCG Mystery Box. It comes with playmats, card sleeves, a deck box, and not one, but two Duologs mini plushies. Individually, all these items would cost over $130. But if you buy them all together in the mystery box, it's only $59.99. Being less than half the price if you bought everything individually on the Duologs Duolog store. However, that's not all. Because it also comes with a random rare Yu-Gi-Oh card. Guaranteed to be either a staple or a high value ticket item like Bonfire. Or your box might just contain a whole box of Vivid and Forbidden instead. I mean, if you get that, technically each of these boxes is worth more than the entire box itself. Additionally, you also get a whole bunch of other random stuff, but only items that are from the store. If you don't care about card games though, we also have the D&D and Pokemon box just for you. Or if you want everything, there's also the everything box, which just comes with one of everything from the merch store. Order yours today, check the link in the video description or the display under the video. And at number one, we have Black Lotus, and the original 5 Moxen and a lot of other cards. I'll explain in a second. Black Lotus is an artifact that's free and allows you to tap it and sacrifice it to add three mana of any one color. The Moxen are all artifacts that you can tap for one mana of their respective colors. All six of these cards are members of the Power Nine and are some of the most game warping cards Magic has ever seen. There was no reason not to play these cards. The Moxen were essentially just better lands because they added the same amount of mana without taking up your land drop. Black Lotus was technically card disadvantage but considering you could be using the mana to cast Ancestral Recall and have mana left over to refill your hand with Time Twister, that really didn't matter. The Moxen and Lotus were some of the most game warping cards Wizards has ever printed, and they're either banned or restricted to one in every single format. However, they're also cards that we've talked about ad nauseum on this channel, to the point that most of the viewers probably feel like the mage depicted in Ad Nauseum hearing about these cards again. Normally, in a situation like this, we would leave the cards off the list to make the video more interesting and just mention them afterwards. But that's not really something we can do here. You see, Lotus and the Moxen aren't just broken, they're iconic. So Wizards has gone and printed new versions of these cards to the point that even if we ignored the originals, most of this list would be zero mana artifacts that add mana. So what we're going to do is put every single one of these cards all at number one and see how much Wizards has had to nerf Lotus and the Moxen before they were fair. The next zero mana artifact that made mana was Mana Crypt, which is less of a fixed version and more of just another equally powerful piece of fast mana. This artifact could be tapped for two colorless mana, but during your upkeep you flip a coin. 
If you lose the flip, you take 3 damage. Oh, the horror. This was printed only a year after the original cycle, so wizards didn't have much time to ruminate on their mistakes yet. Taking 3 damage every other turn on average did nothing to slow how broken the card was, so Crypt was clearly too good. Honestly, it feels like they didn't even try to make this one fair. Their next attempt to fix the cards was Lion's Eye Diamond, a version of Lotus that required you to discard your hand and sacrifice the diamond to add 3 mana of any one color but you could only do this as an instant. Diamond is a card with a very storied history. The restriction to only activate as an instant is the result of very old rules change that would have led the original to be far too close to the actual Lotus. Unfortunately, this was basically just a light slap on the wrist. Over time, Diamond has gotten more and more powerful, to the point where it's really not that much worse than the original Lotus. Tons of combo decks and Legacy use Diamond to kill their opponent. A famous example is Bomberman, which can recur the card infinitely with Auroch Salvagers to win the game. So, it was still far too strong. The next fixed version of the card was Lotus Petal. This is a version of Lotus that only adds 1 mana instead of 3. Petal has been used for years in various formats to enable combos. Literally one third of the effect of the original Lotus is still strong enough that it had to be restricted in Vintage, the most powerful format in the game. The next time they tried to fix these cards, and I hope by now you're starting to get a sense of just how many of these cards there are, was Mox Diamond. This is a Mox that could tap for any color of mana, but required you to discard a land card or you sacrifice it when you play Diamond. This card is, once again, still very strong. Decks such as Legacy Lands and various Stacks decks have used the card to get ahead on mana for decades. Crow Mox is a nerfed version of Mox Diamond, requiring you to exile spell from your hand, and you can only tap for mana of the same color as what you exiled. So you have to get rid of a real card, and it puts it into exile so it's harder to get back. Despite these massive restrictions, Chromox is still good enough that it's banned in modern. The sixth attempt at fixing these cards was Mox Opal, which can be tapped for one mana of any color, but only if you have three artifacts in play and is legendary, meaning you can only control one copy at once, which heavily restricts where the card can see play. Opal got banned in Modern because it was too abusable. Finally, we have Mox Amber, the most restrictive version of this effect we've ever seen. This version can only be tapped to add one mana of a color from amongst the legendary creatures or planeswalkers you control, and is itself a legendary. This means you have to have already cast a spell, and a very specific spell, to get any use out of the card. Unlike essentially every other version of Lotus or Moxen, there are no one mana planeswalkers, and the cheapest being two mana, and most 1-mana legendary creatures simply aren't that impressive. As a result, the card really can't be used for massive turn 1 plays, which is by far the most common way any of these cards has been used. Despite these massive downsides, Mox Amber is still good. It's not broken, but it's still used as a powerful combo piece. In Standard, the card is looped with Kethys the Hidden Hand to make enough mana to combo your opponent to death. In Modern, players have done the same thing even more efficiently with Underworld Breach. We really need to take a second to put things into perspective. Needing a Legendary card in play is enough to make most cards unplayable. All of the Legendary Sorcerers from this same set as Amber were incredibly powerful cards of the same restrictions, and were completely unplayable because they were almost impossible to cast. These cards had really strong effects with their mana cost. Urza's Ruinous Blast was essentially a one-sided Wrath of God which normally goes for 9 mana. Karn's Temporal Sundering was an extra turn spell that also bounced a card for 6 mana, which would have been insane in normal circumstances. Yogmoth's Vile Offering was basically just a better The Eldest Reborn, a card that saw a ton of play in the same standard. Despite how strong these cards were, needing a Legend in play to cast them made them basically useless. Despite having the same massive weakness, Amber being 0 mana makes it so abusable and easy to use that it's still been a part of multiple powerful combo decks. The number one spot on this list goes to the mere idea of 0 mana cards that make mana, because every single one of these cards that has ever been printed has seen play, and most of them have been straight up broken. Even Jeweled Lotus, which is only usable in Commander, is really good in CEDH decks in that format. Lotus and the Moxen, along with their many quote-unquote fixed versions, are by far the strongest cards that cost exactly zero mana, and it's not even close. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other cards that cost zero mana that we may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, let us know down in the comments below.